Have you ever wondered why some people seem to be content with what there is, while others are constantly on the lookout for something new? While some people feel drawn to settle down, others feel pushed to venture out. Society paints a picture in which the former is the reasonable choice, safe and steady. Although growing up in a Western safe and steady society, some of us may agree to disagree. There is a type of person that won't flourish in an environment free of novelty. I am that type of person and maybe you are as well. And that's just the way we are. We seek novelty. We travel, explore, create, rethink and innovate. But why is that? I find it extremely interesting that since I've stumbled across the term novelty seeking and started sharing it with others in conversation, actually very few people seem to ever have heard of it. But they told me they identify with it quite intuitively. So I've started researching a little bit and I want to share in this video with you what novelty seeking is, what it isn't and why I think that it's so, so important for each of us as individual, but also for us as society. The definition I found states, novelty seeking is a personality trait that refers to a tendency to pursue new experiences with intense emotional sensations. Generally speaking, novelty seeking is something that we could describe as a trait, something that we are prone to do. But there is a second part of this definition that shines not only a little bit more light on the topic, but also opens up questions of controversy. It is a multifaceted behavioral construct that includes thrill-seeking, novelty preference, risk-taking, harm avoidance and reward dependency. First, we need to understand that novelty seeking does not necessarily equal novelty seeking. For quite a while, for instance, it has been associated with, well, not so positive stuff. Sensation seeking has been connected to impulsivity, substance abuse, risk-taking and ADHD, which kind of paints the picture of a person unable to control him or herself. Which, obviously, is not the case. No? Not every person seeking novelty is an extreme sports-loving drug addict with attention impairment. But there is undeniably something like intensity-seeking or adventure-seeking. Scientists define adventure-seeking as the willingness to risk physical, social and financial safety for varied, novel, exciting, intense and challenging sensations and experiences. But that is an aspect and that's not all of it. Another aspect, for instance, is openness to experience, which is defined by characteristics like imagination, aesthetic sensitivity and intellectual curiosity. And there is social curiosity, which is a bit like everyday anthropology, the interest and exploration of how other people think, feel, behave and relate to each other. Unlike what we've talked about so far, this may not necessarily be what people picture when they think of a novelty-seeking person. Novelty seekers are not always the crazy and bold personalities that travel the world, inspire people on stage and push for innovative breakthroughs. Novelty seeking can as well relate to people who silently love to explore topics in depth, who have many different interests at a time, who enjoy a critical conversation, who follow events closely and who enjoy connecting the abundance of dots out there to make sense out of them. It is almost like you need to be a genuinely curious novelty seeker to understand that novelty seeking is not and cannot be only one thing. Part of the reason for this particular personality trait is dopamine. Ah, you might say, genes, evolution, of course. But that actually doesn't explain much. Dopamine has become a bit of a buzzword that is surrounded by quite a few misconceptions. One is that dopamine produces pleasure, but that's not really it. Dopamine's primary role is to make us want things, not necessarily like things. Dopamine does not create a feeling of pleasure, nor does it make you addicted. What makes you addicted is the source of pleasure that's responsible for the dopamine release. Another caveat is many people think dopamine is released upon receiving a reward, which, as well, is not really, not necessarily the case. Dopamine is released in anticipation of a reward. Maybe something to think about when you're about to jump the dopamine detox bandwagon, since you may end up provoking quite the opposite of what you're actually trying to achieve. 
Anyways, if you're particularly interested in investigating the dopamine side of things, you might want to look into DRD4 receptors and the 7R variant. But the actual reason that I'm trying to introduce a little bit of nuance and that I'm watering this down so much is, it is pretty hard to determine just one ultimate reason for novelty seeking. The whole dopamine concept seems pretty intuitive when it's about something very specific like sugar, sex, video games, porn or drugs, but it becomes way more complex when you try to think about it in terms of novelty seeking because what exactly is the source of novelty? How exactly does novelty make you feel good? And what exactly is the reward? What exactly do you anticipate when you crave novelty? It is a concept that seems intuitive but quickly outgrows you once you try to pin it down. Knowing which DRD4 variant someone has explains only 3-4% of the variation in novelty-seeking behavior. Whether you are prone to novelty seeking or not so much is not only determined by genes and evolution, but by your upbringing, your social life, the culture you grew up in, how old you are and who knows what else. Genes are regulated by the environment, with environment consisting of everything from events inside the cell to the universe. And that's kind of the beauty of it, isn't it? In a time where we so often claim to know and understand everything, it is not only humbling but also exciting. It makes you want to know more and explore. That as well is novelty seeking. But here's actually some of the stuff we seem to understand. Openness to experience is linked to the default mode network in the brain, which usually is associated with the resting state of our brain, but also with self-reflection, identity, imagination and creativity. The default mode network is a network of interacting brain regions that is active when a person is not focused on the outside world. Another aspect that plays into this is latent inhibition, a mechanism that is responsible for sorting out information that gets to us from the outside world. Kind of like a filter that pre-labels incoming stimuli as relevant or irrelevant depending on the specific situation and goal at the time. All of that is happening pre-consciously. You could say that people, actually the biology of people, with high latent inhibition pre-sort incoming information more efficiently. That goes in, this goes out. People with reduced latent inhibition, you could say on the other hand, are more open to things. And as chance would have it, reduced latent inhibition has been linked to openness to experience and creativity. Having a reduced latent inhibition is essential not only for getting deeply absorbed in the creative experience, but also for generating novel ideas and making unexpected connections. But being only open doesn't really do much for you. If you never act on all your impressions, you ultimately just become passively overwhelmed. What you need is an effective counterpart. In this case, the executive attention network. That's the mode our brain goes into when we plan, concentrate, focus, basically when we want to get stuff done. And it is the ability to switch back and forth between exploration and execution that actually turns into novelty-seeking behavior. And it is also this that eventually turns creativity into creation. It is absolutely important to be open to exploration, but it may be even more important to decide on what to explore. Since we've already started speaking about contrasting concepts, Let's get to the core of it. One very often overlooked aspect when people think about the modern adventurer, like the average, not people pushing the limits of human existence, but one aspect that gets overlooked very often is that most of them are not that brave. And they don't need to be. Usually they've grown up in a somewhat safe and intact environment, free of soul-crushing trauma and existential threats. And that is not that they venture out despite their security, but because of it. A safe and secure base is what our sense of exploration builds upon. But in the West we like to forget that because we live and breathe individualism. We are a product of ourselves, we think, not our environment. But where exactly would you be and what would you do if not for your family, your friends, your peers and your culture? Maybe you don't like that idea. Still. One example that gets overused to prove the point that exploration is paramount are children because they always explore. But once you think about it a bit more, children are also always scared and they are always looking for their parents and parents mean security. And when you don't believe me, maybe you want to take a brief look into attachment theory. 
All that is not to say that you cannot turn to exploration when you grow up in a hostile or insecure environment. You may even be forced to it since it may be the only chance to escape your situation. What I'm trying to say is that human psychology definitely is not a one-way street and it definitely does not always follow common sense. Exploration with great insecurity can lead to antisocial behavior, but security without exploration can lead to frustration and boredom. What becomes clear when you look into novelty seeking is that it's not a trait that only certain personalities embody, but that it is something, a desire, that we all share and long to fulfill. Yet it is so counter to what I've learned when growing up. It is almost like society is inhibiting true creativity and exploration, despite everything we enjoy coming from people that think, act and live differently. Thus, in the process, creating a myth of geniuses that are simply blessed to be different. And maybe they are. Yet the potential for exploration lives in all of us. Despite genes and evolution, despite society and culture. Or maybe even because of it. And I genuinely believe that we desperately need more people to think outside the box, since most of the problems we created seem to mostly come from within the metaphorical walls that we erected to keep everyone inside. And if back in the day a bunch of humans would have not decided to venture out in the unknown, we might not even be here. Yet as much as we crave novelty, we also all long for a place to fall back to if, lost in the enjoyment of exploration, we burned our wings as we flew too close to the sun. Since novelty and security aren't opposites, they complement each other. That has been a bit of a deep dive, hasn't it? Uh, it has been a bit differently. I think, but I also kind of announced it. Um, and it's just something that I'm super passionate about diving or, or trying to figure out how deep can I actually dive into a topic and then in the process explore all the ambiguities and nuances I find in there. And I hope that is something that we share. I also want to mention that I drew from and relied heavily on two books when writing the script. One is Transcend by Scott Barry Kaufman. It's a book about personal growth not so much in the terms of self-help, but better, I would argue. I very much enjoyed it, very much recommend it. Um, and so I do the psychology podcast, which is how I even stumbled upon the book in the first place. The other one is Behave by Robert Sapolsky, which is the book that introduced me to and ignited my fascination for neuroscience, really. It's a very comprehensive, very holistic and very nuanced book and assessment of human nature, just in case you'd like to deep dive yourself. If not, more videos for you coming up. I see you.